This is the Patriots Catch-22 Podcast with Evan Lazar and Alex Barth. I'm Evan Lazar. Evan Lazar. Evan Lazar. Hello, everybody. Nailed it. Joined, as always, by our Barth. That's a bit. That's a match. No risk it, no risk it. 22. Here is Evan Lazar and Alex Barth. That's the first time I heard that back since I, I went off last week about that, and I... I'm okay with it. The internet loved that one. I I know some people were a little bit uh, angry with me. That's okay. I was okay with it. I was okay with it. It was all right. It's fine. I got a little fired up. It Uh, happens. It's fine. I got got a Mac rant coming here today. So Uh, here we go. We'll we'll balance it out. All right. I got a a rant of my own as well, as we normally do on this show. Evan Lazar, Alex Barth, Patriots Catch 22. Uh, Marine Matt, you got a compliment on the opening. Uh, on uh, from a Twitter follower yesterday, I tried to tag you. Did you deactivate your Twitter? No, I'm on there. Uh, okay, I, I don't know. Maybe I just was typing in some wrong things. We'll we'll talk about it. We'll talk. Like Dussault's picture. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we got a compliment, Alex, on the on the intro. It said that well, he, we didn't. He did. Well, yeah. I mean, I obviously gave Matt credit for putting it together, and uh, he said that it was he replays it. He he likes it so much. That he rewinds and replays it before he starts the pot, which I I, I thought was great. So, uh, kudos, hats off there to to Marine Matt. We got we got a good show here today. We're gonna be on uh, for a little bit longer than usual, which is good as well. Uh, no no availability, unfortunately. Right. No, no no press conferences to run off to. So we'll be able to uh, to stay on with you guys here for a little bit longer until unfiltered starts at noon. A full day here on. Patriots radio we got unfiltered uh, we got us obviously the main event right now for sure for from 10 30 to about noon and then we got unfiltered from noon to two and then John Rook in the playbook after that so a full slate of radio and and here on this show we're going to uh, do some studs and duds from the 2022 season we talked about this last night Alex and I, I think you were right and I, I sided with you for once and uh, I don't know how much people really want us to break down the Bills game I think we're more interested at this point in what's next, right? Like, let's get into the off season. Let's talk about the off season plan and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to, we're going to do that for the majority of the show, but I, yeah, and and we can intertwine points from the bills game into that. Like I have some of my takes, like we can use, I thought the bills game was a perfect encapsulation of what the 2022 Patriots were. So as we talk about how they move forward, we can kind of refer back to that game as, for examples. That's kind of how I view it. Right. So we're going to do some studs and duds of the season, whole season, not just that game. Uh, we're going to do positional needs. We're going to do our rankings of the Patriots' potential offensive coordinators, which I think is really what everybody's clamoring to hear. I yeah. have, I've had a lot of questions about what my personal rankings are, and we're going to get to those here today. And and that's that, that's basically where I want to start because – we'll, I think we're going to end with the, the studs and duds because I was going to start with that, but I was, I mean, we can, st- we, were, your no, no, show. I, we were looking at, I was looking some of this stuff up this morning because I think both of us have basically settled on an overarching take on the offense this year, right? Like a big picture take on the offense where we've, we've kind of come to terms with it and, and understand where our heads are at moving forward. And what I looked up today, this morning and I wrote about this in my review of Mac, and then I thought about it some more, and I was like, oh, I really should have dug a little bit deeper on this because now I have it. I, I, I've captured it. So there's a lot of issues that the Patriots offense had in terms of details, right, route running, all that kind right. of stuff that we've talked about, spacing, uh, conversions, like, you know, all that kind of crap, okay? But from a stylistic, big-picture, schematic perspective, the offense fell short in my estimation because they were running an offense that the personnel couldn't cash, right? Like they were right. running an offense that in the comparison I'm going to use is almost a perfect statistical comparison. Okay. Love it when it works out that way. So the new England Patriots this year with Mac Jones at quarterback used play action on 16.7% of their snaps right league average by the way is 20 percent. that's 30th in the league the new england patriots were 29th in the league in motion at the snap right jet motion orbit boomerang like all those kind of fancy 
names and motions. Right. So not in just to clarify. So not like the guy goes in motion, resets right. up. That doesn't count. It's right. a guy literally moving as the ball is snapped. Right. No, that's a shift. Right. Right. Shift is when we're going to move this guy from here to there. We're going to change up the you know the formation on the defense. See how they react to it. Snap the ball. Right. right. That's different. Correct. Thank you for clarifying that. The third thing was what I did put in the article, which which was under center versus shotgun splits, right? Right. This team offensively, no matter who was at quarterback, whether it was Mac Jones or Bailey Zappi, was a significantly better under center football team in 2022. Now, some of those passing numbers are inflated because under center you use play action, right? And play action is always going to have a more higher success rate for the most part than shotgun throws. But basically what this team... Saying under center play action is better right. than shotgun play action. Correct. Okay, yep. Basically what this team was from a schematic standpoint, what they were trying to emulate was the Cincinnati Bengals. They were the Cincinnati Bengals from an X's and O's standpoint. They wanted if to be... If you drew it with the dots. If you drew it with the dots. They wanted to be a spread, gun run football team. And they didn't have Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd and Joe Mixon. Well, and the weapons. Ramondre is pretty close to Mixon, but no, they didn't have it. They didn't have the weapons. I I, I don't disagree with your points as a whole. I do not. The Bengals, just to for comparison, because it's actually ridiculous how close it is. Joe Burrow used play action in the regular season. I know he's still playing. Joe Burrow used play action in the regular season 16.1% of the time. Mac Jones, 167 So we're talking about less a, half a fraction here, right? Yeah. The Bengals, this one is, is crazy. Motion at the snap, 10.5% for Cincinnati, 10.4% for the <laughs> New England Patriots. The Bengals were 28th. The Patriots were 29th. Under center rate. Mac Jones, 13% of the time under center. Joe Burrow, 10% of the time under center. They, they were trying to be that type of offense. Can I ask you one more number? I don't know if you have this. Maybe. RPO percentage. Roughly the same. Eyeballing it, you guess it's similar? Okay. Yeah, I think Burrow had 26 RPO plays, which sounds about in the same ballpark. Yeah. Right? So they wanted to be a gun spread offense like that. That's what they really wanted to be at the core of it. And this game against Buffalo, like you said, so much of it encapsulates perfectly what their season was in the first half. They drove the football with under center play action, under center run. They were under center a lot more on that touchdown drive right after the original three and out. And they drove the ball that way. The wheels came off in the second half. So they attempted nine play action passes in that game on Sunday against Buffalo. Do you know you might already know this, but do you know how many of those were in the first half? All of them. Seven. Okay. Seven out of nine. So they only called two of them in the second half. And don't get into game script because they were in that game until the fourth quarter, right? Like they it was a one possession game. So they wanted to be a team that spread the field quarterback in the gun two receivers this way two receivers that way and we're just going to run up the field and beat you right right nine eight nine four verts like whatever dagger like all these just basic concepts that high, that high school teams yeah. run we're just going to beat you because we're just we're better than you the problem is they didn't have better players they didn't have better players and when you don't have better players and you try to run an offense that's just we're better than you. It's the Bengals are the current version of this. I also remember Belichick talking back in the day about Peyton Manning and the Colts. They were 11 personnel, spread the field, put Peyton in the gun, and just let him go to work, right? Then right. Marvin Harrison over here, Reggie Wayne over there, and that was it. When you have great players like Marvin Harrison, like yeah, Reggie it, Wayne, so like Dallas Clark, when you have Jamar Chase, when you have all these great players – you can play like that. But 
the Patriots don't have that type of personnel. They don't have that type of talent on offense. It's not just better, like, like you have to have multiple top-of-the-league receivers. This isn't saying, right. oh, hey, the Patriots can make a couple moves this offseason and get there. Like Right. So that's the biggest thing, right, is that they try to line up and basically play people straight up. Right. Our guys are going to win one-on-ones. Our guys are going to be better than your guys, and we're going to move the ball like that. And then in the second half, that's what they they went back to right. against Buffalo. And he turned it over three times. Why do you think they're turning it over so much when they try to do that? And I think a lot of people look at it and they say, well, it's an indictment on the quarterback. Right? Max the, sucks. The, the quarterback, you put in more on his shoulders, and the quarterback turns the ball over a lot. And I don't necessarily think that that's totally untrue. I just think it's a half truth, right? I just think when you're getting it to third and 19, you're setting your quarterback up to fail. I just think that there's another conversation there about the the people he's throwing to, right? right? And when you run this kind of offense, you are asking Nelson Aguilar and Devontae Parker and Jacoby Myers and Kendrick Bourne, you're asking them to just get open on their own. Like, you mano y mano, one-on-one, right. on one, like, the guys lined up across from you, beat them, right? Because there's no play action, there's no motion, there's no window dressing. We're lining up and we're hiking the ball. And they just didn't have that. And I think when you have – when that happens, people press. People try to play outside of themselves. Right. People try to make big plays happen out of nowhere. You know, Mac throws a, a jump ball to Nelson Aguilar on the sideline to, to Tredavious White because he's just trying to make something happen. Right. He throws a ball into a tight window th- uh, to Hunter Henry in the red zone on third and 20 because he's just trying to make something happen. And when guys are pressing and guys are punching above their weight, mistakes happen, turnovers happen, sloppiness happens. Like, that's – guys are just trying to do too much. Right. And I think that's such an encapsulation of this entire offense. I mean, even, like, in Vegas, like, guys just trying to do too much, right? Like, it just – where Mondre Stevenson on the five-yard line against Cincinnati fumbles the ball because he's trying to break six tackles to run into the end zone. This was their whole offense all year long, and that's why when we get into coordinators, which we're going to get into our rankings here in a yeah. second after you give your take, when we get into coordinators, that that to me is the number one priority, is that the coordinator, unless they're not going to go out and, and get Jamar Chase and T. Higgins or Marvin Harrison and Reggie Wayne like overnight. So the next coordinator has got to recognize that they are not talented enough on the offensive side of the ball, the line, the skill players, the quarterback, the whole thing, to beat you with simplicity. To, sure. To just line up and beat everybody. And when they didn't do that, the quarterback played well. When they did do that, the quarterback had issues. All right. So I'm going to kind of make the same point as you, but I'm going to use different numbers to do it. Because this okay. – I did some digging yesterday. I actually texted you these numbers. And I think if you really want to say – what went wrong with the Patriots offense in 2022? This I'm going to do it. And Evan, you opened my eyes to this last week. Oh, thank you. They actually, well, the, the beginning part of this, they actually had a lot of explosive plays this year. Yeah. They finished 10th in the league in explosive plays in terms of 20, like just plays of 20 plus yards. Yeah. T- 10th. So not the most, but top 10, you wouldn't think with this offense, right? Right. But here's the thing. And we kind of talked about this last week, but now we have the final numbers. They finished 10th in explosive plays. So they had a lot of explosive plays. Outside of explosive plays, they could not move the football. Right. On yards per play, on non-explosive plays, and this is where people roll their eyes. Why are you – well, if you take out all the big plays, of course the number drops. We're going to go by ranking. The point here is to display that they couldn't consistently sustain an offense. They couldn't march down the field without that big play. Tenth in explosive plays, 29th in yards per play on non-explosive plays. They were the, but, all right, so here's the other thing. All right, so they had a lot of explosive plays. They right. must have been moving the ball then, like, whatever if they can't. They were the only team in the league to not have a play longer than 55 yards. Their longest was they 50. They had this problem last year, too. Yeah, this this goes back. Their longest their explosives was, weren't actually that explosive. Their longest <laughs> was a 53-yard catch and run by Jonu it. Smith. It was the only yeah. play longer than 50 yards they had all year. They had the sixth most plays in the league that gained between 20 and 49 yards. Yeah. So basically, what do all the, that's a lot of numbers. What does that tell you? Great. Ramondre Stevenson had a 40-yard run. 
The problem is that 40-yard run started at the 20, right? So and now you're what? on now you're on the other 40. You maybe get one more first down, you kick a field goal. Right. Like that's what it was. Yeah. Right? They they couldn't sustain offense. They were relying on big plays, but their big plays weren't big enough to get them in the end zone and they had to settle for a lot of field goals. And I think that, that to me is what the offense was and it 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 that is probably Maybe it's the prequel to your point. Right. I, I think that the biggest reason why we got to that right. was because, again, they're just throwing jump balls to Devontae Parker. That's their big play. And that play or, or – you know, Not a ton of room after the catch in that offense. Against Miami, uh, they hit Tyquan Thornton on that fade for on the opening drive for 24 yards. Right? Like, that's right. the definition of their explosive play. And if you don't use – all these bells and whistles I always talk about, play action, motion, things like that, to get guys schemed up in space, then it's it's a point of attack type of play, right? It's it's you get the yards if it's a completion right. or you, and that's it. You know, there's no yak, there's no open space, there's nothing to run into. So that was their offense. And and, and I, I think that as we move forward, the biggest thing that they have to look at is how do we get how do we make this offense easier on our quarterback? Well, okay, so here's my big overarching take for the offseason. I already yeah. said this on a couple shows, but I want to say it again here. And it, it goes to exactly what you just said. There's this group of people that seem to believe Mac has this disqualifying trait that he can't cover up the flaws in the offense. Like, I don't know how many times I've really, quarterback can't cover up the flaws in the offense. Right. And, and it, what, Go find a quarterback that can. I get that's how it worked here for 20 years, and it was fun. really was. But a quarterback that could just can cover up all your flaws, there's, what, maybe four or five of those people on the planet? It's not as easy as just, oh, we'll, we'll go just grab this perfect quarterback. Nobody else wants him. We'll take him, right? Right. If, if there was an opportunity for them to get such a guy, I would be all for it. But, yeah. hey, Evan. That guy's not available this offseason. Yeah, I mean, he also just doesn't grow so, on trees, right? Right, exactly. He's not available most offseasons. People, oh, we'll just go in the draft. The that guy's not there, especially not with the 14th pick. Yeah. There's maybe two guys in this draft that can do that. They're both going to go in the top three. Top two. I think they're both going top two. Eh, Will Anderson's pretty good. We we'll get into that later. But here's my point. Here's my point, Evan. This take seems to be find a quarterback that can cover up the flaws. Why don't you – and it, look, maybe this is just me. Yeah, yeah. But why don't you instead spend those resources, spend that time, spend that energy to fix the flaws? Yeah. Why does the quarterback have to operate with all these flaws around him? Why don't you just fix them and then see how he is? And by the way, even if you are out on Mac, what's so wrong with fixing the flaws for the next guy? Yeah. Right? You go into 2023, one of two things happens. If you fix the flaws, either Mac picks up where he left off in 2021 and then great, we're off and rolling. Or maybe he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe it, it, it's still an issue. But then guess what? When you do bring in the next guy in a year that's better for quarterbacks, by the way, he's stepping into a much better situation. Yeah. The, the idea that saying the quarterback needs help has become some sort of dirty word. Well, I think that every it, quarterback in the league needs help. If the Chiefs don't win the Super Bowl, you know what the narrative is going to be in Kansas City? They traded Tyreek Hill. Getting Patrick Mahomes more help to yeah. replace Tyreek Hill. Exactly. The idea yeah. that, that building around the quarterback, covering up flaws, getting him help is some sort of indictment on the quarterback is so contrary to the way the NFL actually works and the way smart teams actually operate. I actually think it's funny because I. I follow some Bills fans and some, like, cover one. Those guys are great, you know, in Buffalo. And by the way, the Bills are the perfect example of put your quarterback in the perfect position and elevate him. So it's funny because they are, th there's a lot of conversation right now in Buffalo about their other receivers not named Stephon Diggs. Like, Gabriel sure. Davis has gotten a lot of heat this year because he hasn't really emerged as a true second Didn't option. Didn't take that step people wanted. Yeah, yeah. Isaiah McKenzie is kind of a one-trick pony. Uh, you know, it's really just – 
Allen making ridiculous plays and Stephon Diggs, right? Like those are that that's their offense right now. And I think a lot of people in Buffalo are concerned that that's going to fizzle out at some point. That Allen isn't going to be able to just make you know plays like he did again you know, against the Patriots, throwing to John Brown after he extends right. it and comes out the pocket, or the throw to Diggs on the touchdown that was just flat out ridiculous. Like I, I, th- like what happens in a game where they don't get those types of plays from the quarterback? Right. Ne- then what? And th- your take about there's this conversation about quarterbacks covering up flaws is a big conversation about I think personally out of structure playmaking right so in structure is like you know we're gonna run a a slant and you're gonna hit the slant you're gonna run a dig we're gonna hit the dig right like that's in structure like on time in rhythm passing in structure most of the time that's from the pocket out of structure is playground football Right. What 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 happens when? Right. Well, no, it it goes beyond that too. It's you know people say, well, Mac has trouble handling losing. What? So the plan is to just keep losing, and he needs to learn how to handle it. Like, how about yeah. build a team where he's not losing as much? Well, I just think that when people watch Mac, and I, I have this, I, I I personally agree to an extent that he's not he's not a playmaker in the sense that these other guys are playmakers. And so, therefore, you need your system needs to run like a like a machine, right? right. It needs to be, it needs to run smoothly. It needs to ru- operate smoothly. And I think a lot of people say, "Well, I would just rather a quarterback that's system proof and isn't." But that doesn't exist. It, it doesn't exist. But I think the better point is is that it's it's hard to find, right? It's hard right. to find. It's easier to to fix the machine than get a new operator. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't like it and I understand when you call Brady a system quarterback and this is not a Brady's a system quarterback take but Brady was one of those quarterbacks that was a in structure quarterback he's not right. Josh Allen he's not running around and, and making throws off his back foot with people in his face 60 yards down the field that, that and that doesn't need to be your game and I think that's where we get to with Mac Jones where okay it's never going to be Brady in structure but there's nothing wrong with being a sound in structure quarterback. And for the most part, that's like 90% of football anyways. So right. th- th- I want to bring to our, our, our OC rankings here though. Okay. Because, so, so yeah. So let me say that when I say fix the flaws, it's not right. easy, but I think they can do it. And this is the first step in fixing okay. those flaws. So the report comes out yesterday from Tom Curran that uh, the Patriots are on the same page that Bill Belichick and, and Robert Kraft are on the same page and they recognize that they can't run it back with the offensive staff and they need right. to, they need to improve the offensive staff. What, what that ultimately looks like and means we'll find out, right? Is that wholesale changes? Is that hiring some of the names that we're going to throw out right now? What, what's that actually look like? We'll find out, but let's as- assume let's operate on the assumption that that means that they're going to bring in a veteran name brand offensive coordinator and that's where these rankings are basically going we're not yeah. we're not we're not going with the promotion of nick Cayley, right or, or something like that here uh and we can talk about that if you got if people want want to call in 855 pats 500 and talk to us about nick Cayley. i can give uh, you know we can give our takes on that but we're talking about name brand veteran outside hires right so i'll go first and, and we'll just go back and okay. forth here uh Number one on my list is Bill O'Brien. Okay. Number one on my list is Bill O'Brien. And I think the main reason why that I I like Bill O'Brien so much for them is continuity for Mac Jones. Because if you hire somebody like, I don't want to give my names away on the the rest of the list. We should have gone three to one. (laughs) If you hire somebody else on uh, on this list, you are changing the system again. On Mac Jones. That's the third system he'll play in in his first three seasons in, in really the Really kind of the fourth because they sort of had two systems this year. And that's just a horrible – that's horrible for a young quarterback. Yeah. That's how you ruin a young quarterback. So I think the best thing with the O'Brien hire is that basically you're going to get a hybrid – of the Patriots offense under Josh McDaniels and Max offense at Alabama. You're going to Alabama fi the Patriots offense. Is that's the word perfect. I love to use. Yes. Right. I mean, how, how could that's such an easy transition for the QB. It's somebody that I think he'll trust and respect in terms of his acumen as an offensive coach, which I think was a problem this year, quite frankly. 
and it's somebody that I think that they can uh, really grow with in terms of play calling and stuff like that. The other thing I'll I'll say uh, with Bill O'Brien, I don't give a crap about what he did at Alabama this year. I don't care. So I don't care. I know you don't care. Not even an ounce of me cares. The one thing I, I don't care. The production was low. I I think they had some recruits. They 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 had a lot of freshmen and first year starters that were clearly growing. That's outside of his control. The one thing that worries me a little bit, and look, I also have O'Brien at the top of my list, but the one thing that worries me a little bit in terms of what he did at Alabama, I have one other concern with him I'll get into, was that they had a lot of penalties on offense. And it's a different game. It's, I know it's, it's a college football. Look, I'm not Sorry, necessarily it's not saying it's going to carry over, but I... Totally different game. I, there, I, were times, there were times this year... I, I I would watch Alabama on Saturday and watch the Patriots on Sunday. It was like the Spider-Man meme at times in terms of a team that's historically very disciplined, just not. So I just think it's a totally different animal. And, and this is – it's sort of like when people – and I'm going to call him out and I'm going to tell him to his face in an hour. Okay. Paul Perillo said he doesn't want Cliff Kingsbury here either because he was sub-500 coach at Texas Tech with Patrick Mahomes, right, the record. Yeah. We're not asking him to be the head coach, right? You're not asking him to be the yeah, head coach. Yeah, no, people, people right? will so knock to O'Brien. Me it's, the same, it's the same thing with O'Brien. We're not yeah. at, he's not coordinating a college offense here. He's coordinating a professional offense with professional players. So I, I don't really care about what he did at Alabama, and I think that there's a baseline that he gets you back to that might not be as high as the ceiling as the number two guy on my list, but is probably the step that this team needs, right? Yeah. I, I think right now they need somebody to come in to just fix the mess that was 2022. And then we can worry about being super creative and super innovative and stuff like that. Once we get back to square one with Mac Jones, I, I think he's also somebody that maybe hangs around for a little bit. Just, yeah. you know, he's from here. There's reports that he kind of wants to be back up by family you don't have to worry about another OC for Mac in 2024. My big concern with O'Brien, though, is I am somebody who is very into the idea of going out and getting DeAndre Hopkins. I, we talk, right, if they sure. just want to line up and be better than the team across from them, which maybe will happen less with O'Brien, but they still need that guy. Adding another rotational receiver, they've added a bunch of really good rotational receivers the last couple of years. Kendrick Bourne, Devontae Parker, like, I think those two guys have a place in this offense. I do. I think those two guys can be contributors for this team winning football games. But you need to bump everybody down a spot, basically, right? Right. You have Parker getting number one coverage. You want him getting number two coverage. You have Bourne getting number two. You want him getting number three. You need that guy that week in and week out is going to, from the beginning of the season, command the other team's number one corner, command help over the top, things like that. I don't think that guy exists in the draft this year, at least not for them. It's Hopkins. Hopkins is the answer to that question. I, I just think and that I don't know. You know, I, I, I went back. I don't and, disagree with you, but yeah. I, I think the the pushback I'll give you yeah. is that I don't think you hire an offensive coordinator based off of a what if with a 30 year old wide receiver. So like if Hopkins was 26 fair. and it was a it was in the bag that they were going to get him. Yeah. Then I think that that's different, but you are saying that we're not going to hire the right guy for the job just because we might get this other guy who's also mind so, you 30 plus I, years I, old. I wouldn't I wouldn't not do it on the off chance you could get Hopkins, but maybe they know something, right? You yeah. know, a lot of the odds have Hopkins and Vegas always knows. A lot of the odds have Hopkins is is yeah, is the Patriots is, you know, one of the three favorites to land him. Right. I the first thing O'Brien's going to have to do when he gets here is figure out how to, because they need that guy, whether it's O'Brien or not. And look, this, this is the, I've posed this question to you how many times? O'Brien and receiver X, whether that's Jerry Judy or whoever, or Hopkins and offensive coordinator X, okay, whoever well, that get, is. Let's, well, so, but just here's my point. O'Brien or like, O'Brien's not going to come in and suddenly all the wide receivers are much better. You still need to get that guy one way or the other. I think you need to it, get that guy to be to be a true, truly be putting yourself in the best position. But I think O'Brien comes back in and you're the offense that you were last year. But and well, last year I mean 2021. But you, but you want to see growth, right? You want to see, 2020. Uh, 2021 is still last year until the playoffs are over. Okay. I I was thinking about that the other day. I just 
we talked about fixing the flaws and making things easier for Mac Jones, right? Right. You need that guy that other teams are going to dictate coverage to. Oh, I I'm don't not disagree. saying it's impossible to get that guy if you hire O'Brien. I think it's easier to find another offensive coordinator and get that guy in Hopkins than it is to. What if uh, what if Bill puts Bill and DeAndre Hopkins on a phone so conference that, call and says, "Guys, we can do something special here if we just don't let our egos." That's the get perfect in the world. Way. Look, that's the and, and I did some more digging yesterday, and I don't know what you make of this. Hopkins gave a quote to ESPN after he got traded when he was asked about the relationship. Yeah. Amid all these reports, and he said. It's all overblown. There was no relationship. I don't know what that, like, to me, that just kind of means I'm over it. Right. So maybe there is room, and he did say he respects Because it's not like, it's not like he played poorly in that offense. Right. right. It's not like right. he was misused or so, miscast or something uh, Yes, like and that. I was going to get to that. In a perfect world, you get the two of them to bury the hatchet. Maybe time heals all wounds right. and whatever, but okay, we got, it we is gotta, a factor. Okay, we yeah, We got to yeah, go yeah. here. Yeah. All right. Uh, give me your number two. Half uh, an hour in. Yeah, give me your number two guy on your list. I, I think we're gonna have the same list. Yeah, probably. It's uh, Cliff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Cliff for me, Cliff is the most fun. Oh right? yeah, hundred percent the most fun. Um, the boomer bus candidate. I I have questions, not concerns. I just have questions, and hopefully, if Cliff is the higher, I, I'll get to actually ask him. Yeah. Uh, how do you modify your offense to be under center more often? Right, because he's always had Mahomes, Kyler, like he's always had athletic quarterbacks. So he's never really had to coordinate an offense at the bones of it uh, with a guy that doesn't run at quarterback. So how do you modify that to fit? Now, with that being said, schematically, the most fun by far. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy that uses motion, uh, uses different splits, uses spread formations, uh, gets three strong, four strong. Like, this is a guy that does all of, like, the fun stuff that I will love to break down on film next year if he's the offensive coordinator. Yeah. And you're going to see a lot of really creative things. And, and I don't think his running game doesn't translate just because of the running quarterback element because they run a lot of power gap stuff. Like, they run a lot of downhill anyways. Uh, it just has to be modified, obviously, right. for not having a running quarterback. So, yeah. I, I love the idea of Cliff. I I think that out of all the ideas that I've had and you've had and we've come up with, he's has the highest ceiling to me. Cause of I, anybody that can realistically Right, because yeah. I, I think that you can hit a, a really – you can have an offense that really has a lot of firepower um, with him as the coordinator as long as you obviously go out and get that guy that anybody's going to need, like you mentioned with O'Brien. But I, in terms of – aesthetic and just like oh wow that was awesome like they, they would have a lot of oh wow that's awesome type of moments with cliff kingsbury yeah i i don't think he's a very good head coach he knows offense though yeah and and there's a lot of guys i say this all the time right who are great coordinators and that's that's it that's the end of the sentence so i i the first thing that's going to come up is his record after thanksgiving going back to texas tech it is atrocious Right, especially when you compare it to he gets off to some care. really good starts that's like o'brien in college I, do, I don't care about head coaching records for my offensive coordinator. I'm not so asking him to be the head coach. The question becomes is it but but so much his he's never won with defense, right? Right. You know, well, it's that was on his, his problem offense. At Texas Tech. So it becomes does his offense just kind of tank out late in the year or was it just the def right? But but the potential's so high. The potential's yeah. so high that's what's fun. The other interesting thing, that offense doesn't use a ton of tight ends. Right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's they not They did a more big, this year with Ertz. They did more, but the point being, they're not, you know, Hunter Henry and John Smith, their contracts almost up. Those are guys who have struggled. You can kind of just close the book on that one. I think right? that John if you go Smith to Cliff actually, Kingsbury. so I think Hunter Henry would have a role in the middle of the field in his offense yeah. like Ertz did this year. And I, I actually think if anybody's going to tap into some of the things that Johnny Smith does well, it's probably okay. Cliff. Interesting. Because he's going to move him around. Uh, he's going to use him in motion. You think he'd he's maybe gonna... turn him into like a slot receiver? No, I think he'd turn him into like an H-back. Okay. I think he'd be very – I think he would be like a very use checky in, in a Cliff Kingsbury okay. offense. And I, I, I like that idea of that. I'm not sitting here saying that he's going to turn Johnny into a thousand-yard receiver. Right. But I, the fact that Johnny was going to most likely be on your roster, I don't think that he's a total nothing in Cliff Kingsbury's offense. Uh, his offense, the air raid at its roots is a three or four wide 
offense, right? They're right. 11 and 10 personnel offense, but he used a little bit more uh, tight ends once he got right, to he got the pros. Into, okay. Because I, I would call his his NFL offense in Arizona uh, modified air raid, right? Because it's not – they were not a true air you can't raid you can't run true air raid in the nfl you just right. can't it doesn't work so like that. but but they a lot of their core concepts you know um stick mesh uh four verts obviously um y cross like a lot of their core concepts were yeah. air raid concepts the other thing that i really like about cliff is that th they're probably going to be a predominantly gun team with cliff like they're not going to put mac under center 30 percent of the time with cliff kingsbury it's not going to happen right but they would have a real rpo package finally, oh yeah which yeah. would be fun and, and and not only just fun, but I think that that was, I mean, I was banging the table for it all year long. It felt like a broken record on that point. But I think the biggest thing with the RPO package was that their RPO package stunk so badly with the with Matt right. Patricia's, it wasn't effective. And, and look, the uh, Alabama's RPO package during the Mac Jones era is one of the greatest ever. Right. So that's like so the gold Brian standard. That so potentially too. Yeah. I think if O'Brien came back though, they would be more under center. I do. I yeah, but they mix in some of those Alabama RPOs. I think if Cliff King Kingsbury came here, it would be spread out Al Alabama. Right. You're day. not hiring Cliff Kingsbury to keep the status quo. Right. right. So I love Cliff. I think that's a great ceiling. It is the third system in three years type of thing and all that kind of stuff. But I, I think that he would have a great ceiling. I, who's number three on your list? All right. So maybe this is where we where we veer off. Yeah. Uh, Michael Fleur. Ugh. I just think. We veer off big time on that one. I think. Give it to me though. Is this kind of a different? It's kind of a different one. I, mean, I I assume you have Zach Robinson third. I do. So I just kind of wanted to be different, honestly. Yeah. Call it a tie between him and Zach Robinson okay. for third. The interesting things about Michael Lafleur to me: one, it kind of is like we were talking about with Cliff. Let's say they do want to change it up. Maybe they do, and they they were trying to run that Shanahan stuff back in camp, and they got away from it. Hate it. Well, they didn't have anybody in the building who'd ever run it. They were trying to reverse engineer it. Lafleur's deeply experienced in that system. The other thing, and it, I, I'd like to get a coach who's quarterback focused, but we've also talked about their issues developing wide receivers. Mike Lafleur is a guy who's like legitimately developed some very good wide receivers. Has worked with with, with some very good receivers as a wide receivers coach. So had to he, have to have some positive because what he did with Zach Wilson was terrible. Uh, that might have just been Zach Wilson. I mean, it, he didn't make it any better. But look, like, he had Mike White out there slinging it. Joe Flacco led the NFL in passing through the first three weeks. I, here's my thing with the with the. You also Shanahan get, like, tree. he's familiar in the division. Yeah. Here's the thing with my with the Shanahan tree. So I had Zach Robinson at number three, who's McVay tree, right? Which right. I think is, uh, that's different. Like I, I, I Which is actually probably closer to what they ran this summer. Right, and I think that people need to understand that, that, that it's different, and... McVay, especially with Matthew Stafford at quarterback, uh, was less under center, less play action, um, and they were more of a West Coast spread type of offense, yeah. right? And I think with Zach Robinson, the, the biggest reason why I, I like Zach Robinson at number three, and really the biggest reason why I like uh, Cliff as well, I love the idea of a former quarterback coming okay. in here and coaching the quarterback. Yeah, right? I do like, too. I mean, you just, I'm not going to object to that. You just have that mindset, right? You understand what the quarterback's thinking. You understand what he's looking at. Uh, you understand where the, what's hard for a quarterback to do and what's easy for a quarterback to do. And I, I think that Zach Robinson would get his hands on Mac Jones and do some good things with him. Uh, just from a training standpoint, like not yeah. even not even necessarily about X's and O's and all that kind of stuff, but I just think the mechanics would be better. I, I think the the poise would be better. Like I, I think he would have him uh, playing sounder football, decision right. making, that type of stuff too. And I also like the idea of what McVay has kind of adapted to recently yeah. because he was outside zone. You mean besides retiring? Yeah, he was outside zone to to start with and then Belichick figured him out in the Super Bowl and he had to adjust and he's adjust right. to a lot more gap duo type of schemes since then and a lot more spread stuff uh so it it's not it's not true Shanahan anymore in LA and, and I, I like the idea that I the reason why I'm so lukewarm on Shanahan the tree and really going full Shanahan uh with the offense like a like a LaFleur would do is I just don't think you have the personnel for it. And I think people hear that and they're like, well, change the personnel. So we start over at offensive line, right? You got to start there. Right. Because Mike Unwenu is not playing 
guard in a Shanahan right. offense, right? It's outside zone. They need athletes like Cole Strange. And he was, by the way, your, your best offensive lineman. Right. On Wenu. So get rid of Mike on Wenu. Get rid of Trent Brown. Um, and start basically besides Cole Strange, you have to start over on the offensive line. Right. I would also say that do you, do you want Mac Jones bootlegging? Like that's what we want no, Mac Jones they, doing? They've made it work with, with Jimmy Garoppolo and – Brock Purdy. I, I think that they. I'm not saying it's ideal, but like no, it works. No, but no, okay, it, fine. It, no, I don't. I don't want Mac Jones moving. All right, I want Mac Jones sitting in the pocket, and I want Mac Jones getting the ball out of his hands. I, I don't want him half booting. I don't want him full boot. I, I don't want any of that with him. I don't think that he's a good enough off platform thrower to to be able to do that consistently. Like when he's throwing on the move, when his feet aren't set, all that kind of stuff. So I have a lot of reservations about the Shanahan offense for those reasons. I also would point out, is that really the best scheme for Ramondre? No. Because that, it could work with Pierre Strong, but now your 1,400 scrimmage yard running back is basically in a scheme that doesn't fit him either. Well, this is what I keep saying when people say they want to move on from Mac Jones, and I don't think they understand what that means. You're hitting, if you choose, if the, if the decision is to hit the reset button, Ramondre Stevenson's contract is now up before your next contending window. Right. Plus on defense, Kyle Duggar, Matthew Judon, you know, Kendrick, back on offense, Kendrick Bourne, Mike Onwenu, all these guys. Like, you're basically just passing on this core. You're saying this core is not going to get it done when they might. They, there's some good pieces here. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant with the Shanahan guys. Now, let me ask you this. Whether it's Zach Robinson or Mike LaFleur some sort of offensive consultant, quarterbacks, coach, wide receiver, coach role. For either of those guys? Yeah. Why would Zach take that? That's true. Yeah, so he's not. I think the biggest problem that you have with Zach is that if Shan- if uh, McVay, excuse me, retires, right. it sounds like Raheem Morris is just going to take over there as the head coach, so he's going to be the offensive coordinator Yeah. in L.A. He's not. Is he the offensive coordinator now? He's past game and quarterbacks coach. No, but, but – um, Liam Cohen went to Kentucky. Right, but Kentucky. They, ha- they haven't officially named him or okay. promoted him yet. But that might happen. That's probably going to happen one way or the other. So he's going to – I would say that essentially the problem with getting Zach is that it's a lateral move for him. Right. Uh, because I think that he would be given the keys in, in Los Angeles if he stays too. Now, I, I could hear it that to a degree that – look, I, I think Matthew Stafford's cooked. And that yeah. team's going for a full rebuild. Like, well, so that's they have the Cooper thing. Cup, obviously, which is better than anything the Patriots have. But other than that, their their offensive line's a mess. Their quarterback is cooked. Uh, Aaron Donald might retire if Sean McVay retires. So you're rebuilding on right. defense to a degree. Uh, that team is is in a mess right now. Uh, you know, McVay won a Super Bowl, and and they basically they sold it all. They sold their future. They Bowl. sold the next ten years for one Super Bowl. Right, and they won and everybody it, so thought that was going to be the model without thinking about what happens after, and now we're seeing what happens after. All right, let's get to some of these calls, and then I want to do our studs and duds. Uh, okay. Patty, what's going on? Thanks. Uh, sorry to keep you on hold for so long. Oh, no worries, guys. What's going on, man? Not hey. much. So, hopefully with the report that uh, Tommy Curran came out with is true, and um, I think what we've seen over the past 20 years is you're not going to get too many of these historic defenses that are going to drag offenses along the ride with them to, to win a Super Bowl. I mean, the 15 Broncos, I need to throw the 04 Patriots into it. Um, I mean, those are, those are fleeting. It's not going to happen. Um, what we've seen with Bill, and, I, and that's not to say I don't think any defensive-minded guy can become a head coach, but you better get a good offensive mind with you. And that, I think that was just a fatal flaw in, in this past year's team. And I just, I, I'm hoping. I, I want Bill to stay here. I still think he's a great coach, you know. As far as headed misses as GMs is bringing players in, he's pretty good. But come on, let's clean it up. Let's get a guy in here that can run a friggin' offense, and and let's freaking go. Let's see what Matt can do in year three with an actual capable offensive coordinator. That's all I got, guys. Thanks for calling, Patty. And not going to get any arguments here from that call. But I, I think uh, the point about having a defensive-minded head coach and then needing to fill that in with an offensive coordinator that has some metal, I go back to Saban. Right, like Saban's been all over this at Alabama, where he's got Kiffin and then he's got Sarkeesian and then he's got O'Brien. Like he knows, right, that right. that's not his side of the ball. And what I look at with the Patriots and why I have Bill O'Brien and Cliff as number one and number two is that they those guys have been head coaches before, 
and they come in as the head coach of your offense, right? right? Just like Josh was, where that's their side of the ball. They're in control of it. They know what they're doing. And Bill helps, I'm sure, with the quarterback, especially because we've, we've always heard that Bill always has those meetings with the quarterbacks and, and kind of goes over breaking down the opposing defense to kind of – reverse right. engineer what he's right. going to see and all that totally cool with that obviously uh, but that i think really is where you have to when you're saban and your bill and your background is in defense you got to have a guy on offense that's almost equal to you on that side of the ball right right and that's where like patty was saying was the biggest issue yeah no i you should have a guy with offensive experience <laughs> coaching offense i didn't think we'd get to <laughs> At this point where that's point. kind of a but yeah all right uh justin what's up justin hey how's it going you guys hey, hey. i think there is a uh, a little bit of an underestimation of what the patriots need on offense like the possible the the popular thing to say is we just need the number one wide receiver i don't think that's enough i think you need me i think you need both the number one wide receiver and the t higgins gabriel davis level of number two wide receiver now that's a little unrealistic because we have Bill Belichick, and it, it feels like pulling teeth to get any type of receiving talent in here. But what do you guys think about that? Uh, thanks for the call, Justin. We're just trying to move through these quickly. Yeah. I I think that I don't know. I think that they have some good number twos yeah. and number threes, right? Like I think that if you have a guy like uh, I mean, De- DeAndre Devont- Hopkins, just to use the example. Yeah. I think Devontae Parker and Kendrick Bourne uh, can be a two and a three. Yeah. Um, they just they don't look like that right now because they don't have that they're cushion. they're above their weight. Right, of right. the number one receiver. Like Devontae Parker has been a thousand-yard receiver in this league. Yeah. You know, it, if he stays healthy, he can be that guy. It, it's tackle. Yeah, it's I was, tackle. that's what I was like, going to say. I agree with the point that that's not all they need. Yeah. But the point, I think, that it, it's not about necessarily a number two receiver. I think it's it's offensive line. It's yeah. tackle. Their tackles, I we're going to get to studs and duds, so I don't want to get – I'll, I'll wait for that. All right. Okay. Eddie in L.A. We're in L.A., Eddie. Hey, what's up, guys? So, I just also wanted to say something about the wide receiver part of our team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember you, Evan, mentioning that we're second in the league when it comes to explosive plays, right? Yes, uh, 25 so plus. Alex adding... is talking 20. I was doing 20 plus. Yeah, okay, and I plus number, I didn't but... have week 18 in there. Okay. So I, yeah. Anyways, they, they were up there. They're yeah. up there. Yeah. All right. So maybe like adding a better deep threat wide receiver. Like obviously, T. Higgins or DeAndre Hopkins would be amazing, but like even someone like Alan Lazard or like Jalen Guyon, I've seen him make big plays for the Chargers. What do you guys think about them? So. I think the problem is, Eddie, and thanks for the call, is that those guys are more of the same. That's right? the same thing we just talked about, right? Right. But I will – what I what I agree or, or I think what he was maybe sort of getting at is that, okay, it's great if you have DeAndre Hopkins. Like, we all want DeAndre Hopkins. Right. Or even T. Higgins. I would, yeah. I would take T. Higgins. But – How about D. Who, Wiggins? Who's who's the – stop it. Uh, who's, who's Wes Welker? Who's Julian Edelman? Right, like who's the guy when it's like third and six, right? And Mac needs needs seven yards. We're not asking for the 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 sixty yard bomb right now, right? We're just right. asking for third and four, you know, fourth quarter. We're trying to go on a drive here to to tie the game or to take the lead. Like who's the guy that he goes to in that situation? I think that that guy it could be Jacoby. Well, that's Jacoby if he comes back. It could be Jacoby. And and this is also where I, I said before, right, they need that number one guy that's going to dictate coverage. That guy's not in the draft. The the chain mover, the slot receiver, right. that guy might be in this draft. Right. And I don't think you need to use a first-round pick, whether it's Zay Flowers, whether it's Tank Dell, Josh Downs. I mean, Jordan Addison fits the bill, but again, I, I don't think you need to draft the guy that high. Like, there are some good slot options. So if you, you mentioned wa- my favorite one. Who? Jackson Smith and Juba. He's beyond that. I don't is he? Yeah. I he doesn't he's not gonna run well. I don't know if he's gonna run. He's not gonna run. Because he's not gonna run well. Right. So I, I, I look at him as, as sort of like that a little bit. I guess, yeah, but he's, he's it's you gotta use first round pick probably. Right. I love that guy though. So again, if if you want to talk to me, Josh Downs in the second, Tank Dell in the fourth, like, okay, they're like that he, that guy could be the guy, or they could just pay Jacoby. But You're right. Um, 
I love yeah. Jacoby. I I want that guy to have more yak. I just do. I want that guy to pick up more yak. I want to be able to hit him in rhythm and and have him take it further than he should. Right? Like I I, I and maybe maybe if there's more space there, like I just don't think Jacoby's a dynamic enough athlete after the catch to to really be that type of guy. I, I, I would like to see that type of guy in this offense again. And that that's the biggest thing to me is, okay, in terms of that last call that we had about, well, they might need a number two guy also. That's where it kind of comes from with me with that conversation, right? right. Is like, who's the chain mover? Who is the third down guy? Uh, who is the guy that, you know, you just get the ball out to and he picks up eight yards when he only should pick up three? Like, who, who's that guy? Uh, and this offense moving forward, I think, is an important role to fill. All right, last one here, and we'll get our to our says and duds. Uh, Nick, what's going on? What's up, guys? How are you? Um, so I'm, I'm struggling with the Mac. Alex, I've heard your your arguments on a few different platforms now. You know, everybody, every quarterback, yes, we everybody, every quarterback needs like a the good offense, the good tool. But with Mac, there's just some basic things that I keep seeing. One, he he never steps up in the pocket. Every quarterback I see gets pressure. They deal with it. Mac is never stepping up in the pocket. That's a field problem to me. He doesn't have that feel. Second, he always seems to just – he doesn't have these reads. He's not processing quickly. Even I watch Bailey Zappi. He at least has these quick processing. He makes a decision. He's not perfect, obviously, blah, blah, blah. Mac, I mean, even – I think Evan maybe – you did it last week where they had it. Uh, it was a, a steam route from Pierre Strong. I think it was on the interception with Aguilar. Wide open completely misses him and and by the way we know that that, that Aguilar shot you know that's more for Devontae Parker than him it, it, and I've seen that over and over again he seems like he's missing a lot of stuff and then and then lastly the arm strength yes he can throw downfield we have that I just don't see the velocity at all that seems to be requisite you see it on that second uh that two-point conversion against the Bills it, it's like that one to remind you he's done a lot of those where it's like those lateral throws or you know to the sideline throws that they just seem to miss they seem to be in the dirt so I, I'm just trying to understand. Like I know we're trying to, you know, make Matt, make Matt's offense as, as ideal as possible, and want to bring Alabama. And it's like, well, where's the where's the resiliency? Where's the adaptability? And so I think what's missing is these fundamentals. I'll I'll hang up and uh, Nick. I, I just have one quick question for you before you hang up. Uh, sure. The processing stuff that you mentioned. Yes. Did you feel that in, in the pocket movement too? Did you feel that way after his rookie season? Well, and, and I understand. So, so here's the part that I, that I that I'm thinking about with that. I watch. Did you guys watch the Hard Knocks in season? Uh, I watched the Patriots one, but I didn't watch the whole thing. No. So, so, so I'm talking about the Cardinals one this year. So you hear Cliff when when I think it was with Colt McCoy particularly. He's going, look here. This should be here. You should have this. Blah blah blah. I'm I'm imagining that McDaniel did a lot of that for Mac. Right. He was like, look here. This will be open if this isn't here. It was probably, as we, we all know, probably more sophisticated than Patricia could do. So part of my thinking with that is he had McDaniels as like an outsourced like brain. He's like, hey, look look here. I'm not even sure how much Mac was processing because I think Josh like, hey, do this. So so, so that but that so you just proved better. my point then. But also but also, so not the really. reason why I asked you about it after his rookie season, Nick, is is because. Coming out of college at Alabama, uh, processing and seeing things quickly and seeing defenses and things like that was was a clear cut strength for anybody that watched his Alabama tape, right? Like that was the that was his calling card, was that he had right. it between the ears. So I think that that's like the only thing I'd push back on you about is is that that doesn't just regress overnight for no reason, right? Like he doesn't all of a sudden go from a good processor at Alabama, a good processor in his rookie season with the Patriots to what we saw this year without there being some sort of reason for it to regress. So I think that that's yeah, where you, we're coming you're from. Going to the coaching for that? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah and, exactly. And, and that goes back to my point where you're saying, well, he had M- M- Josh McDaniels helping him out last year. This year he didn't have him helping him out and he looked worse. Okay. So instead of knocking him for not being able to succeed when the offense coordinator can't help him out, why not go back and get another offense coordinator that can help him out and see if that fixes it, right? That's sure, kind of my that point. Could be. That's, that's one option, and, and although I still think that's a, that's a deep regression from one year to the next. I mean, that's pretty hard for regression. But, right, which suggests it's not a Mac Jones issue, that there's extenuating circumstances. 
but there still are other issues that I, I don't I don't understand why we're not talking about more with the arm strength and we, we, general yeah. athleticism. Uh, so we talked about the arm strength. The one other I'll talk about with the stepping up in the pocket. It, I've I've talked about this since camp. Yeah. He's sped up. He doesn't know where to step up because the pocket's not consistent. But why he doesn't know how much Zappi time he has. Know how to do that then? Why? Why was Bailey? Because Bailey Zappi wasn't sped up. up because he didn't have to play four games plus the whole summer behind that offensive line, getting inconsistent pressure times. So it was just a bad habit that Max picked up and couldn't let it go. Yeah, that's what's basically what sped up is. Yeah, and that's something that normally that's, coaches that's work not, with that's the quarterback. Not a good characteristic on. to have for your starting quarterback. No, I mean lots of quarterbacks get so, sped up. So thanks for the call, Nick. I. I I agree with a lot of, of the arm strength stuff that's out there. I do. I do. I, I see it on the film also, right? Like when I, I, the, high, the throw I highlighted uh, was on uh, on third down to Hunter Henry where uh, it's a blitz. Uh, Tremaine, John, uh, Tremaine Johnson, right? The slot corner from uh, Buffalo. I think, I, think, so, yeah. I think that's his name, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know why I said that and it feels like wrong. Anyways, uh, he blitz off the slot. Uh, Damian Harris steps up, picks up the blitz. Mac Jones steps through the pocket, and when he goes to throw to an open Hunter Henry, the ball just nose dives. Right? right, it just nose dives into the ground. And if Hunter Henry goes down and scoops it and makes the catch, and they convert and whatever, but if he keeps Hunter Henry up on his feet, then Hunter Henry's got a, a ton of space to run with the football after the catch. Those are the types of plays that, because he's not going to hit the 60-yard bomb to Stephon Diggs, they need him to be able to make that throw to pick up those yak yards because that's how that offense is going to pick up extra yards on top of what is already there. Right, The, the completion of Hunter Henry for the first down was there for, let's call it, eight, nine yards, but there was a 25-yard play if the ball hits him in stride. So I think that there's a lot of merit to some of these arm strength things when it comes to movement in the pocket and processing those are two things that i saw significantly regress this season for mac jones i never thought that that was a problem for him at alabama and i never thought that that was a problem for him for his rookie season so he's yeah he's developed some bad habits and i'm not saying he didn't regress in those ways he definitely did i would just say i think those the reason for that regression was coaching and why not see if better coaching can get him out of those habits before you just totally hit that reset button? Yeah, and I think a lot of the bad habits too that I saw, like he mentioned the the Pierre Strong, you know, releasing into the seam yeah. and things like that. I think a lot of what their offense was in this in this spread gun system that they were trying to run, a lot of it's pre snap determinations of matchups, right? Right. And, and that was a bad decision. Don't get me wrong. Like thinking that Tredavious White versus Nelson Aguilar is a good matchup for you is not a very good decision. But I think a lot of the throws that we've seen him make, uh, where he's quote unquote missed open guys, I think a lot of it is because they're saying to him, like, we want you to get to the line of scrimmage. We want you to pick where you think the weakness in the defense is going to be, and that's where we want you to go with the football. Like, there was one against Miami the week before. I think it was Miami. I, the Cincinnati-Miami games are going together for me for some reason, but I think it was against Miami where he misses Jacoby Myers open over the middle right. and because he throws it to Taekwon Thornton because the safety rotates to Myers, and so he's look, making that initial, initial decision of the safety's going that way, so I'm throwing this way, right? right. Like That's the type of thing that he's making. And then people are saying, well uh, – why didn't he read it out, right? So I think right. a lot of the decisions that I see Mac uh, make are poor decisions when he's missing open guys again is because he's already determined where he's going with the football. Because that's what the offense dictates he do. My guess is yes. Right. Whereas I think with a Mac in McDaniels' offense, there was a little bit more nuance there for the quarterback where right. – Let's read post snap, right? Like let's determine post snap read instead of pre snap. Let's not decide it right away. Let's read this out. Let's read out the coverage and let's get the ball to the open guy. This one felt like find your one on one and take your shot, right? Right, and and I think that that's a lot of where the the open guy conversation and the other, comes from. The other layer of it, it, not to pile on, but your your options are only as good as what's presented to you, right? So when you think you have one thing and then you have you know, to go back to the Bengals game, Hunter Henry and Jonu Smith running into each other 10 yards downfield or Jonu Smith and Kendrick Bourne's routes overlapping. And maybe that wasn't the call in the huddle. You don't know what you're looking at. So that may look like a bad decision, but he he has no way of knowing that the guy's going to run the wrong route. And if yeah. it is a call that is determined, that he has to determine pre-snap, that's taken out of the equation. So again, it goes back to just... Yes, there was a regression in, in, in regards to him seeing the field. 
it really feels like that was coaching related, like you said, because it wasn't an issue last year. Why not just see if with another coach, O'Brien, Cliff, whoever, you can fix that instead of blowing the whole thing up? Yeah. No, I, I, I'm with you, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with anything the caller said. Right? Like, I think all of that is there on film. Arm strength, uh, missing open guys sometimes with processing issues, uh, pocket awareness or movement. Yeah. But I just think that some of those things – I just think he's like identifying the causes saying, I guess, is that – some of those things were strengths of his that all of yeah. a sudden are now weaknesses, and that doesn't just happen. Right, and what changed? Right. And what changed? Right. All right. Uh, last one here. Michael. What's up, Michael? Hey, guys. How you doing? Good, thanks. Um, so, I think, Evan, this is something that you were talking about um, a little bit, especially during the Buffalo game, was like a big need for the Patriots this offseason seems to be outside corner. Yes. And I agree, yeah. and, I, and I don't really know – what their thought process is with Jonathan Jones, if they're going to resign him, if they're going to try to kick him back in the slot. Um, but if Devin McCourty retires, then we're talking about probably a big hole just being the secondary. And our pass rush, especially with Christian Barmore being healthy, was, was really elite. So I wonder how much they're, you know, how much emphasis they're going to put on trying to fill some of these gaps in the secondary. Because if you have an elite pass rush, it helps the secondary out and vice versa. Sure. But I don't know what your guys' thoughts are with the with the secondary this offseason and maybe some options for them, especially if McCourty does retire. Thanks yeah, for the call. it's a good question, Michael. Thanks for calling. We're going to – I keep on saying it, but we're going to get to this does and does here in a second. Yeah. And this is like – I'm not trying to toot our own horns here, but outside corner was something that we were talking about. And I know they drafted Jack Jones, who's technically an outside corner. He's right? 5'11". Outside corner and tackle were two things that we just talked about all off so season. It's, it's every funny. mock draft show, everything. We're <laughs> always tackle corner, tackle corner, tackle for like two years. I was talking and they to uh, like great, great roster building. Jim, guys. I was talking to Jim. La- I was talking to Jim Louth at the Sports yeah. Hub, who told like I was talking to him yesterday or, or Tuesday or whatever it was, and he was like, you know, you should pull the clip. I remember hearing you and Evan on a show about a year ago saying when we get to or in the summer. When we get to this offseason, it's going to be tackle, 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 yeah. corner, corner, corner. Right. Where are we? Yeah. Uh, Where are we? So, yeah, it just totally agree. Free safety. I think the interesting thing is is that Bill wants to be, I would think, a, a post-safety man coverage team like yeah. he's always been. Yeah. But there is a conversation, I, I would uh, assume, that if they don't get that true center fielder, and there's those guys don't really exist anymore, they're not as it's prevalent tough to as find. they used to be. Yeah, if they don't get that true center fielder, then maybe they're more of a split safety team moving forward. Because I think uh, Duggar Phillips, um, if you want to Miles Bryant, Jonathan Jones, like kind of play that nickel slot hybrid what role. About Peppers, you bring him back. Maybe Peppers. Yeah. yeah, I think those guys can play the half field. I wouldn't put them single high, but I think they can split it right. And, and be okay so maybe if Devin retires it's a little bit of a schematic shift instead of just being um let's try to draft somebody or acquire somebody that can do all the things that Devin McCourty did because that's obviously difficult to do even at I know, this stage I, of his career and it, it stinks because there were guys last year I thought like Kirby Joseph was one, right. right I looked at yeah. Kirby Joseph and thought this guy can can play that role I haven't dug as deep into this safety class so maybe that guy exists but and in uh Steve Bell I forget if it was Steve or Brian I think it was Brian actually talked about it earlier this year how the game is changing away from true free safeties and true strong safeties yeah. and everybody does a little bit of both i don't hate the idea of taking somebody you already have in the building whether that's jonathan jones uh whether that's marcus jones whether it's miles bryant and moving them trying to giving them a shot in that free safety role but i know he probably could do it i, I don't want to see them turn kyle dogger into a free safety no just because i don't think he can do it and i don't think the, the role small he, guys can do it either the role he's in right now he's so good in that role he's in right now i wouldn't i, I wouldn't touch that yeah and i i just the reason why I say I don't think Duggar can do it is because I think he's a little bit too stiff to play up top. Yeah. To play up top, you got to be smooth, right? you got to have smooth pedal. I will say. transition. There are – Alabama has four, Evan, four safeties that are expected – were expected to go in the top 100. I think a couple guys may have said they're going back to school. But they've all played – you know, every, all Alabama, these really versatile safeties, right? It's Jordan Battle. Jordan Battle's going to be a, like a first-round pick, right. isn't he? Uh, no, Jordan Battle's going to be second. Brian Branch, um, it, DeMarco Hellams, and I forget who the fourth one was. He might have gone back to school. but Okay, we don't have time for okay, this. They all rotate. They can all <laughs> play deep. Bill's going to have four top 100 shots at an Alabama safety who can play deep. He's, That's going to be hard for him to say no to. Okay, studs and duds, finally. Yeah. 
All right, here we go. I, I like this idea, and I, I'm going to see how it goes with us today because we might, I might want to do this next year okay. as, as a segment. All right, so I think uh, I'll just give my three studs, and then you give your three studs, and I think it'll be faster yeah. that way. All right, number one stud, Matthew Judon. Matthew yes. Judon. I think Matthew Judon, I get that people are, you know, oh, he faded down the stretch again. Uh, not really, like not as bad as last year, the- right? The impact was still there. The numbers don't back it up, like on the box so, score, but... Sacks don't back it up. You right. One sack in the last four games of the season. Pressures back it up. 18 pressures in the last five games. His pressure rate fell like a percentage point. Right. So or, the, sorry, a a, 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 um, a a decimal point yeah. of a percentage. Yeah. So last year, he had, just to compare, this year he had 18 pressures in the last five games. He also had that huge game against Cincinnati, yeah. right? Right. Last year he had eight pressures in the final five games. So this I think was he nothing. had eight pressures in a single game down the stretch. So this was nothing one. like last yeah. year. Yeah, I would also say that it also you know look at what happened with with Josh Uche. Well, that's right. what I was going to say. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I would say is that you know Uche Wise Barmore when he came back, even Aquale had some moments. He in played the, well down yeah. the stretch. Yeah, those guys I don't think get those one on ones if Matthew Judon isn't on the field. So best player on the team. Uh, number one star for me this year, Matthew Judon. Uh, number two, yep. Josh Uche okay. on the other side. 11 and a half sacks, 56 quarterback pressures for Josh Uche. Even though it was all in the second half? Don't care. My favorite player to watch on film all year long. Okay. Dude was in his bag every single week. Like, Judon is just speed rip, right? Like, he's just, I'm just going to go through you to the quarterback, which is, there's something to be said for that, for sure. Uche, on the other hand, like, signature moves across the board, right? He's just stealing moves from guys, right? Oh, I, I'm going to run Von Miller's ghost rush. Then I'm going to run a Hezzy. Then I'm going to – it's just like right. all, all these awesome moves from everywhere. Uh, we finally got the Josh UJ breakout that I've been waiting for, that I've been calling for every training camp. I'm like, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Uh, 11 and a half sacks, 56 pressures. It, that was the best part of their team was the pass rush. Yeah. So I feel like when we do stars or studs or whatever of the year, I got to have the pass rush up top. Number three, Ramondre Stevenson. I, I know that he had the you know some bad moments late in the year, but unfortunately when you go eight and nine and you don't make the playoffs, a lot of your star players are not going to play particularly well down the stretch. And I also would say that a lot of that to me was because they refused to spell him when Dam- Damian Harris was right. Hurt, right. So I think he got fatigued. I do. I think Who's he was got- sitting here in October right. saying you're going to need him late in the year right. and he's going to be tired. He got worked out, uh, you know, worn down. Uh, like we couldn't play Pierre Stronger, Kevin Harris, God forbid. We d- we did that and, and didn't make Ramondre play 90% exactly. of the snaps. Highest highest usage rate for a back in the Bill Belichick era by over 10%. James yeah. White was was 54 in 2012. Uh, not the Belichick era, going back 10 years, which it, the league's different before that. James White was 54% in 2012. Or no, in 20, 2018. Okay, we get it. Anyway, most 67%. Scrimmage, I'm trying to speed him up, Morel. Do you think you can tell? Uh, most scrimmage yards for a Patriots running back since Corey Dillon in 2004. Yes. That, yes. That's impressive, okay? I fourth know he, most I, fourth most scrimmage yards for any player in the Belichick era. It's that Dylan year, 2007 Randy Moss and 2011 Wes Welker. Those are three of the yeah. single greatest seasons a Patriot has ever had. Really, and he's number four. I, one of, if not the best, currently statistically he is the best. Yeah, one of the best between the tackles runners in football right now. Yeah, excellent, excellent season for Ramondre Stevenson. All right, g- give me your three studs. All right, I. I'm just going to go for no overlap here. Like, I agree with you on Judon. But Kyle Duggar. Yeah, he, he, I, I thought about Duggar. He took a tremendous, tremendous leap this year. He's a guy that can impact the game on all three downs. Uh, you know, put two touchdowns on the board on the defensive side of the ball. Brings an edge to that defense. I just thought he added something new that this defense hasn't had. Like, it's we always yeah. talk about... Because Bill's been here so long, you know, we're just talking about the Devin McCourty role or the James White role or the the, the Julian Edelman West Welker role, right? With Jacoby Myers now, I some people talked about Kyle Duggar in the Patrick Chung role, and maybe that's what he was doing early in his he, career. He's evolved. He's in the Kyle Duggar role now. That's what it's yeah. the Kyle Duggar role. It's not anybody else. Um, number two, Michael Onwenu. Yeah, good year for their offensive line to be as bad as it was at times. He was just immune to all of it. Yeah, and the right tackle spot playing next to him was an issue. Didn't impact him at all. 
David Andrews missed time to his left. Didn't impact him at all. Until he got hurt in that Buffalo game, he was going to be just the fourth player since 2012 to play 100% of the snaps for the Patriots in a season. I think he gave up one sack the whole year. He gave up one sack in 11, I think it was 11 pressures. I know he's a guard, but like still. He, for everything falling apart around him, he was excellent. Yeah. He, he deserves a ton of credit and, and maybe an extension this offseason. A we'll lot see. of the one on ones, too, because David Andrews is helping Cole, right? So right, David right. Andrews is open to Cole Strange all the time. Mike Onwenu, vast majority of the one on ones in that line in the interior were to Michael Onwenu, and he stood he everybody was, up. He was Excellent. freaking awesome. Yep. And and by the way, we, we talked, you had Uche, I had Duggar and Onwenu. All three of those guys now eligible for extensions and entering contract okay, years. So it'll one. be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, I'm just. You know me. I like to go off the map with these. Yeah. The corners. Oh, God. All of them. I can't put the corners in there. So here's the thing. I'm sorry, Miles Bryant. I can't do it. All right, fine. I Except can't, Miles I can't Bryant. Do just, it. just hear my pitch out. Hear my pitch sorry. out. Sorry. I like him. He's a good guy. In the calendar year leading up to this season, they lost J.C. Jackson and Stephon Gilmore. Yeah. They replaced them by signing Jalen Mills, who had been a safety. Right. Right. Drafting a f- guy in the fourth round and converting a five foot ten guy to a boundary corner. Everything th- th- about that is set up to fail. Remember what we were talking about over the summer and in the spring about all these qu- – what are they going to do at corner? They don't have enough. They don't have enough. Right. Jonathan Jones, for the most part, was excellent. He faded a little bit late in the year, but – He really only faded against, like – like you're going to get – he had to face 6'4 receivers and he's 5'10". Right. And, right. He, and he's like Stephon Diggs is Stephon Diggs. Right. Like, you know – that. I, I, well, so here's my thing. This is like compared to expectations, right? Right. Moving Jonathan Jones to the boundary went way better than we yeah. realistically co- thought it could have gone. Yeah. Jack Jones coming in as a fourth round pick and was one of right? PFF's highest graded corners mm-hmm. until he got again compared to Bill what wasn't we as good as that compared to Sorry. what we maybe expected him to be though, for the role he had to play, he was very good. He's all right. Jalen Mills was the one guy that was whatever. And then Marcus. When I say the cornerback position, I don't just mean playing corner. No, Mar- you can't say yes, that. Yes, what Marcus Jones gave this team. No, yes, that, that yes. Marcus Jones what, is his own stuff. What you Marcus Jones say. gave this team. So many guys at that you position okay. went above and beyond this year. They deserve uh, recognition. All right, it. all right. Now we're moving over to duds. Okay. I think both of us have the same number one dud, and it's not a player. So. <laughs> oh, I thought we were only doing players. No, I changed mine. No, you don't have to change it if you want to, because I'm not doing Let's, it. You know what? Take, take, because it's obvious. Just besides that one. I think we should do besides nope. that one because we all nope. know. If we're going to do duds for the season, we have okay. to mention it. Well, I, I'm going to try to not overlap dud. with you again, so this is all you. Number one dud, Matt Patricia. Number one dud, Matt Patricia. The worst offense in football, I think. The, like, just in terms of coaching, right? Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, look, we spent the first half an hour of the show yeah, on I'm this. Not how go... many shows in the week? We, we Everybody knows uh, why. No. Yeah. Terrible. Okay. Uh, second dud, and this is, again, not to pat ourselves on the back, but not like anybody could have predicted that tackle was going to be an absolute mess going into yeah. the year. I almost I almost kept Trent out of this. I almost did. But down the stretch, I can't keep Trent. Trent he didn't play well down the tackle, stretch. Tackle. Just yeah. complete overhaul at tackle. Like, they okay. need to start completely over. They need a left tackle. They need a right tackle. We're going to talk about this, uh, I'm sure, at nauseum. Sign one, draft one. Sign one, draft one. All right, tackle uh, number two, just in general. In yeah. particular, if you want to, if you want to name in particular, uh, I would. I can't even give you a name because switching the two of them was ridiculous to begin with. So that goes back to your first dud. Oh God, <laughs> that was what a, coaching, a horrible a decision. coaching decision. And then we can't go back. Like we, right. ha- oh my God, right. what a horrible decision. Okay, number three. I know you're gonna hate me for this, but I'm gonna do it. Okay, Tyquan Thornton. And when you I know say, what, if we're going verse expectations like I did with the corners, it's fair. When I say Tyquan Thornton, I don't mean just Tyquan, right? Right. He was misused His situation. all season long. They didn't get the most out of him. And I think what it bottom line comes down to is that they asked him too often to be crafty. Right. Like they right. asked him to convert his routes and run a full route tree. I, I think ultimately, and I know it drives people nuts in the past that the Patriots don't use their, their high draft picks at receive. I think it was too much on his plate too quickly. Yeah. I don't disagree. So you're, t- it's kind of like my thing on Mac, right? Where I've yeah. said all year, Mac Jones is not one of the top two reasons Mac Jones struggled this year. You're putting the Tyquan Thornton situation, not just Yeah. Tyquan the usage Thornton. stunk. Like, 
all I was waiting for them all year long was to run him on a deep over, and they never did. They yeah. never brought him in motion. They never did anything. All right, three right, duds real quick. really quickly. Uh, Nelson Aguilar, just yeah, that's fair. I don't think we were expecting a ton, but he was unplayable by the end yeah, of the season. He was. I know you said tackles. You focused on Trent Brown. Yep. I Trent Brown wasn't good, but Isaiah Wynn at such another level. Yeah. He was uncompetitive in a contract year. Got benched multiple times and multiple shots. Disappointing. And then the punters. The punters. Both averaged under 40 yards net. Yeah. It, it was it was bad for a team that needed to punt the ball a lot. The worst punting. They were the worst punting team in the league. Yeah. That's a fair. That's so a the fair punters. Gripe. Punters. All right. Alex and I will be back next week. We'll do a lot more of this. We'll do positional needs next different week. Different time next week, right? Uh, different time. We'll be in the afternoon. Still at Thursday. Two. Still Thursday. Still Thursday. But Thursday. Two o'clock. Still on video. See you then. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for downloading this podcast. Subscribe on Apple, Google Play, and everywhere else you listen. Like the show? Please rate and review us. Listener comments and ratings help keep us high in the podcast rankings so new listeners can find us. Be sure to check Patriots.com for more news and more podcasts.